Okay, I've gone into another sequence here because I want to show you how to create panning automation using keyframes. And this is really important if you want to move sound around as the frame contains movement. So whenever there's a picture, the sound must build the world up around that frame and expand beyond what you're seeing. Otherwise, you just won't be emotionally invested in what's going on and it won't have that deep impact and realism to it. So ideally your recorded audio would tell your story completely, even without visuals, at least to some working extent, and this is a test of good audio. So in this case, we are working with a scene where characters simply um, exit a petrol station from sort of center left of frame and they walk off on the frame right. And we need to make sure that our audio reflects this sense of movement, um, otherwise it won't be not only immersive, but it won't even be that realistic. Um, just think, what would it actually sound like if your, if your eyes were the lens? In this case, we have a fixed shot and we need to imagine what that would sound like in terms of um, sound design in order to achieve that realism on our shot. So how do we actually create automation? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, we're going to have a look at them in a moment and how some of them might be preferable than other ways. Um, but basically, the two main ways are you can record right automation, which is um, you can actually play the track through on the timeline, and as you're playing it, you can make a change, and that change will be imprinted by keyframes onto the track. So that's one way of doing it. It's a very smart way um, that you might see a lot in music production or uh, various other applications. Um, another way is that you can manually enter keyframes. Um, so there's a couple of ways of doing this as well, and that gives you a lot of control also. So um, one of the ways that you might do that when you're first starting off with Premiere might be um, more the After Effects way of doing things on a clip level using the effect controls. So this is a way of doing it. I don't think it's the best way, but I'm going to show you how you might do it this way just as a starting point. Let's say we want to pan the clip at the end here, which is um, some footsteps that we have off to the right hand side. And by the way, let's just understand before we go any further that the clip or the clips we're working on at the moment, these are mono clips because they play back equally on the left and the right side of the stereo image. Um, and we can see that if we expand on the track that it's actually one audio wave, not two. So um, the blue uh, audio, which is paired to the camera visuals, is a stereo file we can see left and right side, but our green standalone audio file is just a mono file, it's one wave, and that is reflected as we play it back on the master fader meters. It's identical on the left and the right sides. Another way of knowing that is simply to select it in the project file list and press the grav key or the tilde key, whichever you want to call it. It's the one left of Z and it's a really good shortcut for Adobe. And we can see that's 44.1, 16-bit, which is CD quality, and it's mono, so it's only one audio channel. Ideally, it would be 48 at 24 bits because that's our pro audio standard. But hey, we can't always have our sound effects as we want. We have to just do, do with it. So anyways, one way of doing this would be simply to keyframe the panning, um, which is ready to go in the effect controls. So if it's going to start, let's say, let's say it starts here in the center on this clip. We're going to add a keyframe here. Um, and there we go. It's added our panning keyframe. We don't need to see the extra gubbins. And as they walk off, I want to force it to the right side, which is 100. Now, you might already be feeling that this isn't the most intuitive way. Why is the right side 100? Why is the left side minus 100? Well, it just is because it corresponds to the pan pot here on the, um, on the track mixer. Um, we also have it on the clip mixer as well. It's a bit confusing this way. I'm not recommending this way necessarily. I'm just showing you that this is a logical way that you might approach it if you've come in from another program. 
but I'm gonna show you some slightly better ways because this way, well, the main issue with it is that not only is it not necessarily visually very intuitive as to what's left and what's right, but it's also confusing because it's, it's applying to the clip only and we only see it here with two diamonds when we select the clip. So in the next clip, it's actually gone back to being in the center, which isn't very helpful because I want that footstep sound to stay on the right hand side as it comes from one clip into the other. So you're starting to see already that there's some issues when it comes to panning on individual clips. Um, not to mention the fact that it's not very visually intuitive as well. So um, that is something that I think we should avoid. So we can delete those keyframes or we can just press the stopwatch and get rid of them. And um, also we're going to reset that back to zero, which is the center. Otherwise we'll get tripped up and we'll just check that we haven't done anything here as well. Great. Okay, so a step up from that would be to actually write the automation manually using the panning pots of the track mixer. Um, so that should be zero, um, which is dead center. And this way is smarter and it's more something that you would actually uh, physically do if you had a control surface. Um, it's very popular in the days of sort of analog mixing. Um, and that is, we can set this automation mode to write. And now, if we press spacebar and allow the scrubber to play through the timeline in real time, we can make that change here, and it will be imprinted, not on the clip, but on the track, because we're in the track mixer. And this is quite smart. So I'm just gonna show you what's going on here. It's quite a quick movement, so I'm gonna have to sort of do this fairly quickly. I'm going to grab it and push it up, and it's going to go to the right-hand side. And I would need to do that for the underlying clip as well, the underlying track here, which is audio three, which is our female footsteps. We have a different sound file for both. But anyway, so that change now, if I slowly scrub through or just let it play back, you can see that that change has been imprinted. I'm going to take my hand off the keyboard I'm just going to play this back so that you can see that what I've just done has been imprinted on that complete track. See, so it's doing that now by itself because that's imprinted on there. And the first time I did this, I was thinking, well, okay, that's great, but how do I, how do I see those keyframes? Where are they? Um, I mean, you might be happy with it, in which case, fine, but you might want to overwrite it, which you can do. You can go back and you can, because it's on touch mode now, we won't go into these in too much detail, but once you've written automation, it goes into touch and you, you can leave it in touch mode um, or you can go into latch mode. And there's a slight difference between those um, latches. Basically, it will, it will stay on throughout, whereas touch means it will revert back to its initial state afterwards. But in any case, don't worry too much now. Um, but because it's left in one of these modes, it's going to continue writing automation if I make further changes. So be careful there. I'm going to put it back to read because you could accidentally type in a load of automation that you don't want and that can trip you up. So it's back in read mode now. And it's going to, again, it's going to play that automation out as I play back the track. OK, so to view that automation, um, you might not be aware of this, but you must expand the track and the default is clip mode. So you can select individual clips and you can, if you wanted to, for example, you can press um, command and you can, that changes your cursor into a keyframe addition cursor. And then you can drag that around. So in this case, it's, it defaults to volume. So let's just do a little fade at the end of these clips but we're still on the clip mode and I'm not able to see those keyframes that were just record automated on there. So how do I do that? Well, over here, show keyframes. This is the button where you have all the control of what's really happening when you do these sort of automation um, recordings. So select, 
And well, what have I done? I've recorded track panning. So I should expect now, all being well, if I select this, then now I can see the record keyframe automation that I imprinted a few moments ago. And um, it's easier to make sense of this now because this line now is no longer volume, but it's actually the panner balance. And if I hold command and click, I can just demonstrate that zero is the center. And when it goes up to the left, sorry, to minus 100, that's the left. And if I go down to plus 100, that is right. So if that was to read as panning automation, that would go from the middle. Then the sound would dart across the frame to the left side and then it would go from the left side all the way over to the right side. So that's how you make those changes happen. And that's really, really handy to, to know that that exists so that you can work at a track level. And by the way, as a general rule, when you're working at a track level, you, you're less likely to trip yourself up and you're able to see what's happening across a range of clips, which is really useful because when it comes to panning, um, it's very common that you want to make these changes across many clips in the timeline. Um, so it's just better practice when it comes to working at track level than clip level. I'd like to encourage more people to work at track level, but I don't think people do a lot of the time simply because they're not aware of these tiny little um, <laughs> features. I mean, Adobe make them a bit tricky to see, but it's really handy to know. And not only can you automate panning from one side of the frame to another, um, but you can automate any effect that you have inserted onto the track slot. So this is really, really handy to know. So when it comes to effects on the track, any effect that is inserted here, um, regardless of what effect it is, that effect, you will then be able to make changes to parameters of that effect using these keyframes, which is really, really important. If you want to, for example, um, you want to make an equalizer change in real time if someone, let's say, is walking um, from inside a car to outside a car, it would not sound evenly, um, it would not sound essentially the same without some automation in the EQ because as people move around different surfaces and um, different spaces in real world, the EQ of a sound can change depending on what absorption um, is happening in that acoustical environment. So that is really handy to know um, when it comes to adding realism to some of your scenes that require a, a real-time shift of the sound um, according to what's happening in the picture. So bear that in mind. Um, I hope that all makes sense. Um, now, if we wanted to, we can delete some of these keyframes. I just want to show you a really handy way to do this rather than the way that I'm currently doing, which is a very long-winded way of doing things. One way is that you can just simply record through it again. But if you want to select these keyframes, and I still am on the track panner view, so I can't select individual clips, and I can't select the keyframes. I can select individual clips sort of in this way, but it behaves differently when you're looking at the track panner. So the way that you highlight all of these keyframes is to actually use the pen tool. Now I can highlight these keyframes and I can press delete and I can delete big chunks of keyframes. So that is really quite nice to know as well. Um, just to bear that in mind, if you right click over multiple keyframes, you can do what's called an ease in and it gives you a nice kind of gradual curve and then you can change the, the, the points here to give yourself a different type of a, a keyframe transition, if you like. So really, really handy stuff to know um, that you might be familiar with if you work a lot with other programs. There's nothing stopping you from manually punching in a load of keyframes. That's absolutely fine. It's just another way of doing it. Um, and you've got a bit more control this way. Sometimes when you're record automating, keyframes, whether it be volume or panning, it's quite difficult to get it right because, you know, you're ultimately using a mouse to force those controllers around and you can sometimes get quite extreme results. Sometimes it's just easier to command click and do it that way. 
Um, and try to stick with working in track mode if you can. You'll just get more out of it and it will be easier to manage a lot of clips over the course of your timeline when it comes to working with large amounts of data. And just remember that um, if something isn't behaving as you expect, it's likely because there is perhaps a clip, I'm just gonna put it back to clip mode, it's likely because there's a clip that contains some panning information or something that you've maybe done earlier that you just need to go back through and check um, that can cause you to trip up later on.